so let me start, uh, I guess, at the message server at IBC Go. Um, so this is kind of where messages come in. Um, and so the first message we have is this create client. Um, this will allow a relayer to create a client for any chain um, on, on, on the chain that this message is submitted to. So uh, right here, we just are unpacking certain things and we, we unpack things in the message and we create the client, which I can show you here. Um, when we create clients, we generate a local uh, unique identifier called a client ID. Um, and this doesn't have anything to do with a chain ID. Um, we don't actually use the chain ID at all in, in IBC apart from verifying headers. Um, so that's probably one of the most important things to understand about the IBC security model is that IBC has no idea whether like what the actual chain is on the other end of the client. It just knows that I'm talking to this client, I'm going to make sure that this client is kept in sync and that every update to it is valid. And I'm going to prove that, um, that, this, that any, any message sent over this client is actually, has actually been sent by, by verifying these Merkle proofs. Um, so that's very important to understand. You know, my laptop, I could create a tenement chain on it, call it the Cosmos Hub, and connect to Osmosis. And um, IBC on Osmosis will just create a new local identifier for my client, you know, 07 tenement 13 or something. But that doesn't mean that IBC knows that my, you know, blockchain is just a laptop and the Cosmos Hub blockchain is a real blockchain. It doesn't care. Um, all it cares is that it has this client and that it can verify that that client is, is kept up to date and valid. Um, do people have questions on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering, was there ever any discussion on kind of, uh, on not, on having a situation where um, you would be able to connect to a client ID that you already knew of? Is it possible to connect to like have two connections to the client ID? Like, was that, I guess, I guess like it's not now, but was that something that was ever discussed? As in like, is it possible to connect knowing that you're talking to the Cosmos Hub or something like that? Um, yeah, to the IBC client ID of the Cosmos, of the real, of the canonical Cosmos Hub. Yeah, um, so it, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because how do you get that information? Um, Right. So, and this is kind of the same problem you have with off chain like clients, right? Um, if I want to, um, if I want to start a light client for the Cosmos Hub or for Ethereum or for Bitcoin or that for that matter, I need some sort of initial root of trust. I need to get like an initial block to work off of. Um, and then once I have that initial root of trust, I can make sure that any subsequent updates are valid given that initial root of trust. But you can't really get around that initial root of trust. And so we didn't build any um, in-protocol way of getting that information apart from just letting relayers do it in this very permissionless way and not making any assumptions in protocol about what those clients are actually referring to on the other end. Um, I think it's a lot of the IBC architecture, I think is pretty analogous to how the internet works. And you know, it's kind of like if, um, kind of the base layer of, of the internet doesn't really know whether this IP address is Amazon truly amazon.com or whether it's saying it's amazon.com. We have this other layer, you know, DNS that kind of has this root of trust that we build in um, that lets browsers verify that, you know, this, this server that I'm talking to is actually amazon.com. Um, so that might be built one day for IBC, but it doesn't exist now. Um, so it's kind of the responsibility of wallets and exchanges and maybe blockchains to kind of um, infer that information. Mm -hmm. and what's, what's the information that is coming in the message to create the client? Uh... Yeah, so that's a good question. So what comes into the client is a client state and then an initial consensus state. And this initial consensus state is a root of trust. Um, so the initial consensus state will just be kind of, you can think of it as just a header. Um, really, it's just the next validator's hash and a timestamp and a height. 
Um, so we only take the information from the header that we absolutely need to save on space. Um, and so that consensus state is acts as our initial root of trust. And then the client state can, includes all of the parameters that we would need to verify headers. Um, so it'll have, um, it'll have parameters that are required for all clients, like the chain ID. Um, and we can actually dive into an example here. If I look at the Tenement client here, um, So this client state will contain chain ID. It'll contain the unbonding period of the chain. Um, it'll contain the latest height um, and, and proof specs, which we'll get into. Um, so these are all like parameters that every client of a given chain will have in common, right? So if I'm creating a client at the Cosmos Hub, uh, all of it will have the same chain ID, but I can also choose certain parameters, like I can choose a particular trust level, um, I can choose a particular trusting period, and this kind of lets you choose how secure you want your light client to be. Um, so there are trade-offs between how efficient and fast the light client is versus how secure it is, and um, we allow users to, to kind of tweak these styles to pick what they want for their applications. And I can show you the consensus state uh, for Tenement. Um, so here, as I said, again, it has just a timestamp, a root, and an X validators hash. And this is the initial root of trust that we use to validate subsequent headers. Do you mind to uh, elaborate a bit more what's in the root and the next validator hash? Yes, definitely. So the timestamp is the timestamp of you know, the block that we're creating. The root is just the app hash. Um, so it's the hash of the application state of the other blockchain. And as you might understand, as we get into things, um, that hash is the root hash that we'll use to prove that something was included or not included. Um, so we'll use Merkle proofs that have to hash up to this root. And if our proof hashes up to the root in the consensus state, we know that it was included in the other blockchain. If it doesn't, we know that the proof has failed. Um, and next validators hash is really just the hash of the validator set um, for the next block um, of the counterparty blockchain. And we use this for verifying the next header. Um, so if we want to do kind of a sequential like client, which will do you know, block by block validation. So this would require the relayer to send every single header to um, to the uh, to the light client, then we would um, we would use the next validator hash to prove that the commit was signed correctly, um, to prove that the header was signed correctly, um, and we can also have bisecting light clients, which are a bit more efficient, and that will allow you to skip some some headers and just prove that a two thirds majority from this next validator hash signed the the next header. And if the validator set changes uh, after creating the client, then, yeah. then the hash, the validator hash changes, right, as well? Yes, those are all great questions. So that's kind of, you'll see in the update client, um, okay. part, which we'll get to. So do people have questions about create client and particularly like this local naming thing and how we don't actually trust or make assumptions about what the counterparty is? Cool. So now we've had our relayer to create the client. Um, so, you know, going back to our diagram, chain A has created a, a light client for chain B um, in the state machine, and chain B has created a light client from chain A. Um, 